event of this week on the flexibilization of uh, higher education. And today we have a very special uh, speaker from um, Swaziland, if I, if I understood right. So uh, Karen Ferreira Myers, and your topic today is really very, very of this time, really the pandemic. So university lecturers and staff development in a post pandemic world. And if I understood right, we were just discussing about maybe having an identity of a, a person from two countries in the audience. So you have the same uh, background, if I understood that you are originally from Belgium. Is that correct? So that's the case. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you 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 are looking at the the context there with with maybe two two different perspectives too. So so welcome, Karen. And um, we are first we are going to hear you give the presentation, and then we can have a, a nice conversation afterwards on on this topic. So welcome. Super, thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to be with you all. Um, I will be sharing my screen um, just now. Um, let me just see if I'm taking the right document. Um, okay, now I can't see where it, where is it, where is it? Okay, there it is. Um, as Timo has said, uh, indeed, I am originally from Belgium, um, but I left Belgium a long time ago. I've been in Eswatini, uh, Swaziland is now called Eswatini since 2018. I've been in Eswatini since September 1990, so more than 30 years now. So it's, it's, been, it's been a long time. Um, I, I still consider myself half Belgian, half Swazi. So um, I do understand that idea of looking at things from, you know, two different shoulders, from two different brains, maybe. So I wanted to talk to you today about uh, university lecturers and staff development in a post-pandemic world. And I'm really happy to have uh, this opportunity. OK, who am I? Um, Timo had asked me to uh, briefly introduce myself. So I'm uh, at the moment an associate professor. I'm also the coordinator linguistics and modern languages at the Institute of Distance Learning, which is part of the University of Eswatini, formerly known as the University of Swaziland. Now, Swaziland is a very small country uh, in southern Africa. We have uh, three quarters of our border with South Africa, which is a real giant in uh, many aspects, and uh, one quarter of our border with Mozambique. We have officially, we have two languages, two official languages, English and Siswati, and Siswati is a Bantu language. Um, I've I'm kind of uh, an example of a lifelong learner. Um, over the years, you know, I've obtained four master's degrees that are quite uh, varied. The first one was in Romance philology. Then uh, I did one in linguistics for the language practitioner, uh, an instructional design and technology one with the Open University of Malaysia and uh, a, a master's, a, a law degree and then a PhD in French and Francophone literature. I love um, communicating, I love translating and interpreting, uh, mainly between French and English. Uh, I publish regularly also um, on uh, various research areas. And so um, these are some of the things that uh, I wanted to share with you. So, um, for today, I thought it was important to give you a bit of an introduction and in the context uh, in which I am talking. I will talk about professional and or staff development for university uh, teachers, lecturers, professors. Um, that brings me, of course, to lifelong learning, but also collaborative and peer learning. And the, uh, an important point on resilience, uh, something that we've tried to cultivate since the beginning of the pandemic even more than before and i think you know many of us are really trying to be as resilient as we can 
Now, I need to look at what happened before the pandemic, what is happening currently, and how that will impact what we do if one day, hopefully, the pandemic will be over. Nobody knows, of course. Uh, but in that post-pandemic world, I would like to uh, see more issues of open education, open educational resources, uh, open pedagogy, flexibility, self-directedness. And when I've spoken about all that, I will get to my conclusion. Uh, so on your right hand side, you have a small map of Africa with then the uh, even smaller country of Eswatini. The capital city is Mbabane. So as I was saying just uh, before we started recording, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, it has hit us very hard. It has hit, hit everybody around the world hard, and it has uh, brought a lot of uh, a lot of headaches, a lot of uh, physical and emotional pain, uh, which is not over yet, which we will have to live with for a long time. But I must say, and some others have said it before me, there is definitely a silver lining to all this. Because in my opinion, the pandemic has really shown us that uh, we need to, if we hadn't started, we need to reflect on what we do, in particular in the field of teaching and learning. And I so for me, um, this is an important lesson that COVID-19 has taught us and continues to teach us. So shifting from that expected situation of classroom communication to now a distance or online learning environment um, can possibly have a major impact on motivation and also on the acquisition of certain skills. Are we acquiring these skills in a similar way, in a different way, um, when we are uh, exchanging ideas and working together in collaboration, in cooperation, online as opposed to a face-to-face uh, -face setting. So how did we train staff pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and how do we envision to train them post-pandemic? Uh, we know that the informal and the formal learning resources and tools, just like the Zoom we are on today, are really everywhere. Um, and, and that has brought uh, this main focus of many educators on the so-called 21st century skills and the integration of technology, the use and the integration of technology. So when we look at professional development, that staff development, um, we really need to ask ourselves, are we, do we need to reskill or should we merely be upskilling? Have people, um, have they got a sufficient basis from which we can start and then upskill? Or do we really have to forget about the main skills we had and completely reskill? That's one of the things we need to look at. Then we need to ask ourselves, what kind of staff development is needed? We know that um, a university lecturer basically has three main parts of his or her duties. That is teaching, that is research, and that is community service. So in which of these areas are those new skills most needed? Which of these areas need, do we need to focus on when we are developing uh, our staff, when we are professionally developing our staff? And perhaps we should even be thinking that professional development might need to go beyond being development merely for our profession, but needs to go towards developing as a citizen, a citizen of the world, I would hope. So when should we train staff? How should we uh, train staff? Um, we used to do staff training mainly in face-to-face -face workshops. And so because of the pandemic, this is now almost impossible. We do online, we do blend it when we can, but we notice that it has a different impact when we work online as opposed to face-to-face. -to -face. So the idea also uh, of getting staff to understand the importance of lifelong learning, 
but also of autonomous learning, um, being responsible of our own learning. I think that's a major point. Uh, we try to inculcate that in our students, but is staff ready to do that? Are we ready to continue learning new skills throughout our life and um, making sure that we um, upgrade ourselves continuously? Uh, personalized learning, I think, is probably what um, new technologies will be able to assist us with, so that each of us will have a different learning path. I might have some skills that I want to develop and to which I want to add others, while my colleague in the office next door might have a different skill set and want to go in a different direction. So that personalized learning, I think, is also very important. And then, you know, we say we live in a, a global world, we should be learning from each other. So I think peer learning is also something important. And finally, there's that issue of building resistance. Now, I think many of us, if not most of us, understand the, ben the benefits of lifelong learning. Um, now, if we really want to develop a learning culture in our university environment, I think we should be planning ahead and perhaps even looking at developing an annual plan. Um, we might have a policy. At the moment, we don't have one here on lifelong learning, but I think other universities might already have that a specific policy on lifelong learning. Now we need to have a plan that shows us how we are going to achieve whatever we've set out in our policy. And then we can take a strategic approach. Um, the strategic approach also means that we budget for certain activities. Now I, uh, as you might understand, uh, living in a uh, developing nation uh, comes with um, extremely high budget constraints, uh, we basically have no money to do anything. So that also needs to be taken into consideration when we try to plan ahead. Um, we also need to find out which of our staff members need uh, training and development most so that we can focus on them, but we shouldn't leave the other ones behind because I, I think it, for me, it compares a little bit with what some of us do in, in, in the education sector. Uh, very often we focus on the slow learners and then we forget you know, that there are also those fast learners that also need to be challenged, that need to be given opportunities to uh, really develop as well as possible and as fast as possible. So I think each and every staff member, once we uh, make sure that the staff members realize their need for learning, each and every staff member should be able to identify what are their needs and what type of learning activity will benefit them on that uh, path of lifelong learning. Now, when we look at the, the mental habits that support lifelong learners, I think uh, this little uh, visual is really uh, a, a nice one because I, it, research has shown that um, people who uh, consider themselves lifelong learners are risk takers, are people that can self-reflect on where they are and where they want to go. In general, these are also people that are open to new ideas and that listen to themselves and listen to others as well and find out uh, new information, find out uh, new ideas, uh, innovative thoughts from the others around them. So I think it's, it's that combination of, let's call them personality traits, I think that is a, a really good mix for um, the lifelong learners. And, and that then it also means that if we can identify those characteristics, it means we can also teach those that might not have any of those or might not might have some of them, but not all of them. We can teach them to um, acquire those particular characteristics, I think. 
Now, when it comes to collaborative and peer learning, um, we know that peer learning is defined as building knowledge and skills through an interaction with people who share similar characteristics or status and uh, where nobody is really the teacher of the other. Basically, everybody teaches the other, but none of them is a professional teacher. None of them has a status above the others in that peer learning. So again, this is something that we ask from our students in many cases, but are we as university lecturers ready to learn from our peers? And that comes with a big question mark. Um, we know that uh, collaboration among teachers is linked to the improvement of practices um, because the learning process allows participants to equally participate, to equally contribute, to uh, really give the most of what they have. And uh, that can, of course, be done in a face-to-face -face setting, but it can also be done in a virtual environment, in the online world. So uh, in the workplace, and I would say a university is a workplace, uh, employees can be teaching each other, um, and then uh, maybe some, uh, I, I was going to say older, but not necessarily, but some more experienced staff can help newer staff, and newer staff can come with um, innovative ideas that maybe uh, more experienced staff has not even thought about. So I think that interaction is really, really helpful. Um, I hope that if there are any questions or comments, you are already putting them in the chat or holding them for later. And uh, because I really look forward to that interaction, you know, after my uh, short uh, talk. Um, but just to let you know that at the moment, because I'm screen sharing, I can't see the chat. So if there's anything urgent, please do interrupt me and, and come in. So I, I, I thought it would also be useful to look at resilience. Um, and, and resilience is really uh, keeping going, you know, uh, keeping on uh, in difficult situations, pressing on, you know, continuing with whatever you're doing or looking for solutions so that you can keep going. And I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has shown us that uh, people who can cultivate resilience are the ones that are doing better than others. I, I, I wanted to say are uh, thriving, but maybe that's a bit too much because I know we are all tired and exhausted, but the resilient individuals are really um, continuing, being present, continuing, uh, doing what they need to do, continuing with whatever duties they have to take care of. So when we look at the definitions, and, and we must say that the the concept and the conceptualization of resilience uh, varies very widely. Uh, but one definition is uh, that it, resilience is an individual's capacity to respond to stress in a healthy manner so that the person can still achieve the goals at the lowest physical and psychological cost. So continuing to do things, achieving your objective, achieving your goal, uh, while remaining as mentally and physically healthy as possible. I also like uh, Brewer and colleagues' definition. It's a 2019 one of resilience, um, because uh, those scholars were really looking at the higher education context in particular. And they defined resilience as follows. It's a dynamic process of positive adaptation in the face of adversity or challenge. And this process involves the capacity to negotiate for and draw upon psychological, social, cultural, and environmental resources. So I think it's really that definition that I would like you to keep in mind as we proceed. I also want to go back to a 2014 um, book uh, by Kezar, 
who proposed a change model that draws on six theories of change, scientific management, but also evolutionary, political, social cognition, cultural, and institutional theories of change. And for this researcher, effective change can only happen if there is a multi-theory, so in addition to a multidisciplinary and a collaborative approach, it has to be a multi-theory approach. And embedding resilience enhancement strategies requires uh, fundamental changes in staff's underlying values, assumptions, structure, and processes. And Kezar then looks at uh, the role of teaching staff and talks about a second order change. Now, that second order change requires us all to reflect on our role in relation to resilience. What can we do uh, to build resilience in ourselves, uh, in our colleagues, in our team members, in our student population, but also in our institution as a whole. And the idea is that then we re-examine our priorities and approaches to teaching, and we adopt the role of a change agent, a leader, so that we can help others get their own resilience skills uh, improved. So um, the context of change, of course, requires consideration. The change that is needed in a first world university is different from that in a third world university. Now, by that, I mean that perhaps the students in a third world university might already have more resilience characteristics at the start of the pandemic because they have been going through difficult challenges basically since they were born. But we can all enhance our resilience skills uh, during and post pandemic. Now, many people have said, yeah, but you know, resilience might be innate. We might be born with it. It might be even genetic, or it might have to do something with our environment, as I was saying about the difference between the third and the first world. So we might say, you know, if it's a personality trait, what can we change? Um, research does show that resilience can be developed and enhanced through direct action. And um, that direct action is always in, respond, in response rather to uh, risk. And risk is the exposure to a disaster. Resilience is the answer. It's the recovery from a particular difficult event. So it, it also, it's also linked with trauma, um, emotional intelligence. I mean, we can't separate those uh, clearly. So Ducek, and now I'm coming to 2020, so, you know, the pandemic had started. Uh, Ducek um, was trying to conceptualize organizational resilience. And um, he, uh, she rather, uh, proposed a number of theoretical propositions. And she also noted that the definition of resilience differs. It has changed over time. And in particular, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought in additional layers to our understanding of resilience. Now, the organizational cap capabilities um, depend on the different context, and they altogether underlie the three stages of resilience. And um, those we will talk about a little bit later as well. They are very important. Um, the, third stage, the third stage being the, the, the adaptation. How well can we adapt to the new situations? Now, resilience is highly complex. I'm sure we've understood that and uh, linked to social context. And uh, we, we can't really say that um, the different components are fixed or determined. They keep on changing. And that's why, you know, it's an unstable type of concept. Um, what is important also uh, in resilience 
is that uh, if there are strategic contexts based on knowledge and uh, strategic drivers such as resource availability, but also social resources, so related to human resources, and the issue of uh, who holds power and who has the responsibility over what, these contexts and drivers are also extremely important. Now, I said there were three uh, different um, layers to resilience. The first one is we observe, identify, and prepare. This is the anticipation phase. Of course, with COVID-19, we didn't have much of an anticipation pay, uh, spa, um, stage because we were thrown in the middle of it. The second one of resilience, personal resilience, but in particular also institutional or organizational resilience, is that of coping. I think many of us today are in that phase. We have kind of accepted the disruptions. We are trying to develop and implement solutions. So we are coping or we think we are coping. And then from that coping stage, we need to reflect. We need to think, are we doing the right thing? Is this change useful to us? Will it lead to long-term planning? We are learning from what we have put in place. And this is when we can adapt. So those are the three stages that depend on resource avail availability, social resources, and that's where you know the peer learning, the collaborative learning all come into place, and issues of power and responsibility. As an individual, do I have the power or the responsibility to put in place certain solutions that I might think are useful for my environment? Why do we build resilience? I think that's clear. It's uh, really, if we increase resilience before a major disruption, then uh, we can see the, 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 the positive consequences immediately. If we haven't done so, then during the disruption, we really need to put it in place because it reduces the emotional impact of that disruptive event. And then it also gives each and every one of us as academics, as university lecturers, more control over what is happening. We can support ourselves, our learners, our colleagues, but also our families at home. So I think I wanted to underline that one. Now, how do we build this resilience? Um, we can look at it from different ways. I think one of the ways to look at it is really to foster resilience through wellness. And I think in universities, well, uh, in particular in African universities, we have not looked at wellness very often. And the pandemic has shown that we should. Because if we don't look at wellness now, when it's actually already too late, then we might end up, you know, with uh, sick, emotionally unbalanced, uh, exhausted people upon whom we then can no longer depend. So we need to acknowledge the fear and with that plan for the future. We need to look for role models. Um, some of the colleagues here and in every university have been doing better with the disruptions and can serve as role models. We can look at them and observe and learn from them. But we also need to identify those who are struggling most and assist them. And I don't know if you know uh, an Egyptian scholar by the name of Maha Bali, who talks about pedagogy of care. And I think this is really a concept that we should be using when we look at uh, fostering resilience through wellness. Right, so um, this is basically what I've said uh, uh, until now, but in a visual form, we have the three stages of resilience, anticipation, coping and adaptation, with on top of that, the, the, the factors or the elements that can help us. And then if we manage to get it all together, hopefully we have a better and improved institutional resilience. 
And this little drawing is based on research done by Abdullah and colleagues in 2020 as well. What's a resilient institution? Well, I think we've touched upon many of the issues already, but it's one that has effective communication channels. Um, I remember at the beginning of the pandemic, we received no information, no feedback, no support through our usual communication channels, meaning from top management to middle management to uh, everyone else. And that was just non-existent. So that really delayed a lot of the processes. So a coherent crisis communication strategy is very useful. Uh, also support for staff to develop digital literacy, um, have that digital infrastructure in place that is effective, easy to use. I think Zoom is an example of something that is actually quite easy to use and that has had an important impact on uh, continuing teaching and learning during the pandemic. And, and you can see here, you know, so it's issues of leadership, it's issues of strategic planning, but also flexibility. And I think I'll come back to flexibility a little bit learner, later as well, communication and support being important. Okay, pre-pandemic staff development for us was face-to-face -face meetings, face-to-face -face workshops, uh, basically one day, but if we had a bit of a higher budget, we could have a longer session. It was very much instructor centered and there was little place for flexibility. So somebody decided this is how we are going to train you and you would sit in the training and hopefully learn something from it. And that was that. So this is how we used to do it. And then of course came COVID-19. I like this, uh, this, this drawing, uh, this cartoon basically where you know some people are in a meeting and saying digital transformation is years away i don't see our company or our university having to change anytime soon but there comes the big boulder which is the covid 19 and of course digital transformation had to happen we had no more choice so we all i i won't belabor this point but we all clear that the covid 19 pandemic has really been disruptive. And in order to uh, protect ourselves, to survive in the long term, to build that resilience um, against the current, but any future pandemic, because from what I understand from the scientists, uh, we will have uh, pandemics coming to us probably faster than we've ever seen before. So if we want to survive and if we want to be resilient, we need to really rethink our systems, re-engineer our educational and institutional plans or choreographies, and we need to look at various dimensions that are all critical, that are all essential. So what have we been doing during the pandemic? So as I said, uh, little communication between management and staff, which was very, very worrying for quite some time. But behind the scenes, there was some movement. Um, we have a Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, which is a very young and understaffed center. And we have the Institute of Distance Education, which is where I am based. Um, we received a request from our vice chancellor to prepare a training program and uh, form a little team uh, to uh, train teaching staff. And that was because the transition to online learning was with us. We had no choice anymore. So what did we do? We designed two online courses and a series of webinars. And um, those webinars are still ongoing. At the moment, we are working around authentic online assessment, for example but also personalized support from uh, the IT staff, but also from the instructional design staff uh, was provided to basically all staff. Of course, it was on a, people participated on a voluntary basis, but uh, we were really encouraged to all participate. 
I just want to briefly, I don't know how I'm doing in time. Um, I think I'm probably running out of time, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the two courses. Um, the first one, which was a little bit more theoretical and uh, pedagogical um, in design and in content. The second one, TBL 003, was really hands-on practice of the different Moodle features. Okay, I've talked about the webinars with a lot of question and answer sessions and examples of how to, how to uh, upload an assignment, how to design a quiz, how to um, prepare a live lesson, et cetera, et cetera. So we used a scaffolding approach, which was socio-constructivist and connectivist in nature with lots of opportunities for reflection, collaboration and teamwork. So it was, the idea was really, we'll give you basic information, we'll try and help you get the basic skills and the opportunities to practice, but we also wanted to include a lot of food for thought so that um, while we're in the pandemic, we continue thinking of what needs to be done post pandemic. Okay, so this is the course overview. Um, you can see it, it looked at different things, communication, uh, strategies for uh, designing an online course, the important pedagogical principles that were needed, etc. Um, so from planning to designing to looking uh, at the students learning experience and then really to the development of that online course. Some further uh, examples of what we were looking at in particular, so different uh, topics. And then now I want to come to that post pandemic. What should we do to uh, in, in the field of staff development in the field of capacity building? Now, when we look at what we need, we need a whole list of things. We need to be trained on digital pedagogies continuously, inclusive education, equity, the pedagogy of care. Um, I'm, I'm repeating Maha Bali's concept, uh, AI, artificial intelligence, but also virtual realities. We need to really delve more into the idea of open education, which here is still something quite new. We need to look at diversity. Uh, teachers as intercultural learners. We need to broaden the teaching team. So go from one mono teaching to peer teaching, collaborative teaching. We need to look further into assessment and evaluation. We need to look at the internet of things. We know that we need a whole lot of skills such as flexibility, adaptability, emotional intelligence, collaboration, leadership skills, self-management and self-monitoring, which are part of self-directedness. And then how should we uh, be developing our staff competencies? Through lifelong learning programs, through peer learning, through self-directedness, so auto-learning or personal learning, through partnerships with industry or with other universities, through networking. So our training resources, what should they look like? They should be open educational resources as much as possible. And we should also be using open, open source technologies. So we went from learning as an event to learning continuously, learning as a process, learning in the flow of work. We went from technical skills first to skills or capabilities first. We went from digital learning as a supplement to an integrated environment, integrated digital, virtual, and in-person learning, depending on the time we have, the place we are at, the person we are. And from a more structured development, I think we really need to go to a self-directed and personalized development. So, um, the question, the main question is, are our university lecturers ready for the changed roles that they will need to take on? And I think that remains a major question um, to which we can only start bringing an answer together. Okay. 
from digital as nice to have to digital as must have is one of the things, but I think that really requires us to think about it even further because the digital must be combined with the human. If we divorce or if we break the link between human experiences that are social and participatory from an integration in the digital world, then we won't be getting anywhere. Okay, so what are the solutions? Open education, open educational resources. I'm, I'm sure the colleagues are all aware of these things, so I'm not going to delve into these deeper, but of course we can talk about it, open source technologies. And then the one point I think which is extremely important is the idea of flexibility. Are we flexible? Is a university a flexible environment? Can we be flexible enough? And I really like this visual. So we, we've been telling people, yeah, you must think outside the box, you know, just think innovative in an innovative way, think of other solutions, think outside the box, think outside the box. We keep on repeating that, repeating that. And then this young man says, they taught, they only taught me how to think outside the box, but I'm not trained for circles. So this is where the issue lies. You know, we need to teach people to be flexible. One day we will work outside the box. The next day we will work outside a circle. So flexibility, online learning and its benefits, flexibility is always there. I've just got the ICDE uh, quality network report of February 2021, which really talks about the link between online learning and flexibility. Flexibility as practice, as delivery, as uh, achieving equity, as a means of gaining a competitive edge. So these are representations of flexible learning. Um, you can see that um, these are all aspects of flexible learning. Uh, again, I'm really running out of time, but I want us to look at self-directed learning because for me, this is really important as, uh, as part of staff development. It's an approach where staff learners gradually assume personal responsibility and control over both cognitive and contextual processes in constructing and evaluating meaningful and worthwhile learning outcomes. And I'm quoting Garrison, uh, 1997, which his work was based on Nowell's, of course, 1975. So it's not something new, but it's something that is extremely important if we really want to um, go into a post-pandemic world or a continuously pandemicized world uh, where, you know, we need to build resilience. Right. In conclusion, where are we? Where do we want to go? There are many solutions, but they all require cooperation, collaboration, flexibility on our part, and all the stakeholders also requires networking open educational resources, open education, open technologies are possible solution for university lecture staff development, but we need to keep on looking for other solutions as well. And with that, just one last image that life is not about how fast we run or how high we climb, but how well we bounce we bounce back from this crazy pandemic. These are my references, or at least some of my references. And with that, I'm halting my sharing, and I am looking forward to hearing from you now. And sorry, I really took too much time. I'm sorry no, about that. No, not to worry, Karen. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I think we already had have some um, questions there in the chat Great. and uh, maybe maybe Pat for example if you could uh, comment um, comment by voice instead of just uh, us reading so please what would you like to pick from your comments to to, to question we cannot hear you Pat Ah, 
got it. Sorry, I couldn't get my microphone on. <clears throat> um, yeah, I just want to talk about confidence because I think it's very close to the notion of resilience. Mm. Um, but I think we forget that self-confidence and confidence in others are the key to learning in all contexts, in all situations. I think unless people have self-confidence, they won't take risks, as you were saying, and they won't have confidence in others. And if they don't have confidence in others, they won't be able to work in a team and so on. So I think that the key basic skill is self-confidence. And it's actually quite easy to teach. And that brings me to my other point really about being wary, I'm not su suggesting you are doing this, but th there's a, a tendency to attempt staff development with a deficit model. All mm. these things they can't do and they have to learn. And so I would prefer, and I think it links to building self-confidence, to start with all the things they can do and all the things they've done amazingly well with no preparation and no training and nothing. And OK, it wasn't perfect, but they did it. They did it and they survived. And so I think that would be a more positive starting point and a, a, and a better starting point to build self-confidence um, and confidence in your colleagues because your colleagues also survived. <laughs> um, so, so a better kind of positive model, if you like. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you for that, Pat. I, I really like the idea of starting from what we know and what we can, because as you said, I mean, we really need to look for role models and they are very much among us everywhere, you know, people who have been doing well and, and, and who can share how they've been doing well. So I really appreciate and also the idea of self-confidence. Yeah, great, great. Thanks. <laughs> Very, very interesting uh, comment, uh, Pat. And I have been thinking the same um, when when we had organizational changes a few years ago, uh, people experienced quite a lot of stress. And to re release that uh, stress, they were going from door to door to, to ask the colleagues that, have you heard about this change? And have you heard about that change? And how is that going to affect us? And then we, we actually had to hire a psychologist to talk about something called responsible behavior in the workplace, mm -hmm. that by, by kind of like uh, intermitting everybody with this stress, they were trying to gain more confidence, but they were actually taking everybody a step back. Mm -hmm. So I think you also mentioned that in the, in the presentation, uh, Karen, that what is this kind of responsible behavior as a colleague or, or student even. Another comment came to my mind that in a way, uh, teachers can kind of like also communicate this, what, what Pat just said, that uh, the, the, the abil abilities and the positive self-beliefs of coping and being resilient. So I think it was a very, very good, good comment there. Uh, there, there was two uh, comments from Susan, and I think uh, Christina also raised her hand a, a little time ago, but uh, Susan, would you like to comment something? Yes, um, thank you. This was really wonderful. I mean, I just spent the whole time making notes, and um, I could talk even a much longer time than we've got about this. Maybe I can get your email, Karen, but... Um, I've been gathering data for the last two years on resilience and emotional intelligence levels from my students. Originally, I started because I teach leadership courses and I wanted to see if their levels um, grew after taking my course. And so as you were talking, I was thinking, because I really haven't done anything with this data, and I thought, I really need to start looking at it, what it was like two years ago, maybe just over two years when I started collecting mm. and what it is now after COVID. And that could be another research study. You know, I would anticipate that their levels have grown from say yeah. two years ago to now. So maybe, um, you know, you could share your email and we, we could talk and even, even do research, you know, on that. But, um, and, and then just another comment was um, I also, 
work a lot with employers and what do they look for out of employees and um, and it's exactly what you're saying you know they're okay we don't really know what's going to happen in the future but if we train the minds to be anticipatory you know think of what might happen and how do we adapt and, and try and give those employees the skills or students the skills to be able to adapt quickly and be open-minded to think okay we can do it you know and and um yesterday I mentioned to Maureen about our closed-minded faculty who said no no this could never be done this could never be taught online but then hello it it did everything changed and people started adapting when they said they couldn't and so sure. what you were saying about the closed box the and the circle you know if we could help enhance those skills of adaptability and flexible thinking and anticipatory thinking you know that would go a long way but um, yeah this was fantastic a lot of food for thought thank you thank you thank you i've, I've put my email address in the chat Ooh, so yes it right. would be wonderful to keep talking <laughs> definitely mm -hmm. I think I think Karen, you, your email inbox will be loaded with some <laughs> some mails because it was it was so uh, I think uh, reflecting uh, our our experiences here, for example, in Finland also, and and as as others have al already commented also, uh, there was a comment from Polanka, and then uh, I'm still asking if if Christina you had something in mind, but. Whoever wants to comment first, please. Yes, I can. Um, I can say a few a few things. I would like to thank you very very much for this presentation because it's the core, the core of our coping with the situation. I think mm -hmm. is to cope with ourselves and how we deal with changes, and this has been very very vivid at the University of Ljubljana where we usually say that we have 26 faculties and they are all sort of subcultures mm -hmm. because they deal with different disciplines and different professional backgrounds and liaisons and mindset. And um, they were actually very interested in, in the past of um, about how each other are working and how they, they, they like to present um, their work, but they were not really, you know, anticipatory. They didn't really understand on how to apply this and how to better oneself or to, shall I say, transfer the skills from one to another. And they were, they, they were very interested, but not really, <laughs> didn't take on, didn't take on board on what was said on the other side of the, of the bank of the river. So they so they felt, but now the the good practices are really, you know, like okay, <laughs> can I take this? And they really ask each other whether they can use their intellectual, shall I say, or innovation, pedagogical innovation, and they're very keen on taking on board on what others have thought of, you know, because it, in a way, it's. Um, it's comfortable because someone has tried it and it worked. And it's also in a way uh, waterproof. So, okay, so I can use it. And I don't have to think very much about it because, you know, we are all very burdened, not only with this uh, situation, which um, caught us in the middle of the pedagogic process. We, we have all other concerns to think about besides the disease, the families, the safeguard of our loved ones, you know, the situation at work in general. So um, if somebody helps us in this situation, not to, to uh, waste too much energy on, on, on something is really good. <laughs> you know, that's one aspect of it as well. You know, so there are some think tanks who are really absorbed in, uh, in trying to find the solutions in this problems and the others they they are following but more are following than than would usually do okay this is what i wanted to add sorry 
Very good. So you're also addressing like the, the collegia support that uh, people have been giving and, and receiving through. So Karen, there was also a very uh, interesting comment from uh, Jane earlier. So about you mentioned something, the institutional choreographies. Mm. Jane, yes. would you like to elaborate on that? <laughs> yes, thank you. Phrase that I thought that's just what's needed. That's exactly what it is. It's about, because within the choreographies, it's about the dynamic, it's about the action, it's about the flow, it's about communication, it's about all of those things. And um, I think the pandemic has, and as different people have, you know, reinforced, has enabled um, institutions to actually take that central role rather than leaving it to all the individuals to see how um, resilient they are by it you know sometimes it feels like you or used to feel like you were just being pushed over all the time yeah. and yeah. those that got back up were very good you know so it's it, and and I, I didn't like that idea that individuals were responsible for an institution's um, delivery without having them as part of the of the dance if it's yeah. a choreography yeah. so um I, th I thought that was a lovely way of of phrasing it and really what i would like to see and i have seen in our institution really happening during the pandemic in lots of different ways and those things that you can you know the the ways that different people can be part of that whole community and pull together mm -hmm. to support each other to enable that uh power or or um bounce back as it as it were so i thought that was really interesting thank you Timo, Sorry, you're now you hear okay. me. <laughs> now we <laughs> yes. can hear you. <laughs> so, so thank you, Karen, and thank you all the all the comments from the participants. I think we have now reached the the time time limit of this session. So, it would be really great to have you with us in the network actively in the future. Also, so I'd I'd love to. Yeah, so you are yeah. most welcome to Thanks. join join our our sessions further on also. And uh, thank you everybody for the active uh, and lively discussion today. I hope that also tomorrow you would you would join us with the panel discussion at same time same time as as today. And Karen will be the, one of the panelists there. So so see you then tomorrow also. Okay, so thanks you, thank you a lot, and uh, have a nice evening. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye.